is an extremely opaque market. It's heterogeneous. It is difficult to navigate. Sure. You can see this in the carbon credits. I mean, we've been in it for a while and I'm still like sometimes unclear on what these different credits actually are referring to, sure. what assets they are actually trying to protect and who is monitoring all this. We have seen a sort of fraying of the market because these problems were papered over, because people rushed to the next step without solving. So, for example, in a nature-based offset, it may be, yes, you can put the credits on chain, but if you don't solve, the key issue is who is monitoring that credit and does that credit actually reference real asset? If that's not being solved, you can put it on chain, you can put it on uh, this or that platform, doesn't matter. You're still sure. trading something that lacks transparency, that lacks a fundamental push to having actual impact. Yo, what is good, Refi Nation? John here from Refi Dow, dropping an episode with D Climate. We have a chance to sit down with the Jaw Brothers. Sid and Osho are experienced entrepreneurs with a background in Wall Street and commodities and derivatives that have built two very successful and impressive organizations. The first at Arbol, providing parametric insurance for farmers using climate data, and the second, D Climate, an open data infrastructure platform that makes it possible for people to analyze complex data sets and build applications on top of them. In this conversation today, we'll hear a little bit around the origin story of how these organizations came to be and take a bit of a deep dive into Cyclops, this new satellite imagery-driven monitoring platform for nature-based solutions. This initial deployment is a really significant milestone for environmental asset markets, building high-integrity digital products that buyers can trust. They know the capital is going to protecting forests and they can verify it in near real time. Time. We also touch on Aegis, a climate risk um, assessment platform applied to the city of New York City and others to really look at what is the cost of these severe weather events and how can we analyze different scenarios to have different outcomes for our local communities on the ground. Hope you enjoy the episode. It's definitely a stellar example of the regenerative finance thesis. There aren't many projects out there that have really found product market fit, but I think D-Climate is well on their way to pioneering a new market and a new industry and making it possible for an entire ecosystem of developers to build on top of this data set. If you enjoy the show, please do give us a five-star review if you enjoyed this episode. It makes a massive difference and let us know what you think. Cheers. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks so much for coming on to the show. How are you doing today, Sid? Yeah, uh, good. Uh, thanks for having me on, John, and uh, it's a pleasure. Man, it's been a long time coming. I remember our first conversation, Osho, and I was just like, just getting into the refi space. I remember talking to you and having my absolute mind blown about all the stuff that you guys are working on. And now it feels like you made real critical mass in what you're doing. Um, what's what's present with you today, sir? Are you sitting in New York City, feeling good about the Cyclops launch? Yeah, yeah, both uh, both sitting in our New York City right now. And yeah, John, I remember that. Uh, I remember that conversation. Hard to believe that was almost uh, three years ago now. So the whole uh, the whole refi space as a whole has uh, grown a lot. A lot of products being shipped. Uh, we're excited about the work that we've been doing. So uh, looking forward to kind of digging into some of those pieces today. Yeah, Definitely, and I love man. the collaborative nature of the space. It's it's really nice to see so many groups and projects come together to solve. Mm a very critical problem that we all need to contribute to. Totally, man. And it's not always easy working together, but I think you know, building specific pieces of the puzzle that other people can interface with is really one of the best contributions. And I'd love to look at kind of the big picture of what you guys are doing at D-Climate. You also have Arbol and you have a number of products that kind of illustrate the power of this open data platform. But do you want to give us a quick 10,000 foot overview, Sid, of what you guys have built and a little bit of where it's come from, and then we can dive deeper into it with Osha? Yeah, for sure. So, um, uh, you know, uh, our backgrounds, mine and Osho's, were uh, mostly on Wall Street. Uh, mine was a little, he a little heavier on commodities, which um, actually quite a bit heavier on commodities, which really makes you very, um, you know, cognizant of climate risk. Uh, weather mm. is a big factor in the supply chains and the production and consumption of these myriad com commodities. And I was in the hedge fund space and bank uh, bank space as well. Um, so, you know, in 2018, uh, uh, I left uh, 
Citadel where I was at to form Arbol with, along with Osho and uh, another co-founder. And the goal with Arbol was to, you know, start addressing the problem of climate risk. Uh, mm. How do we mitigate the financial impact of climate change? How do we mitigate the financial impact of increasingly vulnerable populations being exposed to climate risk? And climate risk, when you think about it, is perceived as, yes, there's a storm and it affects, uh, you know, a local community. And that is absolutely a big problem with it. But what is often less realized is how pervasive it has become. So every mm. bank in the world is struggling with climate risk in its mortgage loans or farm loans. Um, you know, asset managers at a large scale have investments all over the world. Well, what's happening with hurricane risk and many of these other risks that might be affecting the physical assets. Uh, another uh, very uh, underappreciated part of climate risk is if you think about renewables, how do we scale things like solar and wind? Well, a big problem with renewables is the variation of wind speeds and sunshine. And those variations cause variations in revenue, which cause sure. difficulty in raising capital for projects like that. Right. So it's it, the problem goes far deeper than just, uh, you know, the local climate risk that many, many communities are faced with, which itself is a $200 billion plus problem now, right? Um, and over half of it is uncovered by insurance. Uh, why? Because those models are arcane, they're old school. An adjuster has to come to your farm or business, and it may take a year sometimes to get your claims checked. You're a small business, you go bankrupt while waiting for your insurance check. And sometimes yeah. that check may never come. So Arbol was created to solve that problem, mm -hmm. right? And how do we do that is we utilize data to make those payouts. So hurricane data says there was a hurricane near your house at wind speeds of this much, here's a payout. Uh, you know, you're a farmer, rainfall was super low during the month of July, as measured by hyperlocal data, here's a payout. No yeah. more adjusters, we can cover the whole world. And now, you know, we, you know, earlier this year, we crossed over a billion dollars of uh, risk that we had transferred away from vulnerable populations and vulnerable businesses to capital that is seeking these products out. And mm -hmm. that was the real thing here, is you have to connect both sides to make this work. What does capital want? Diversification, low correlation. You know, a rainfall contract in Iowa or a temperature contract in, um, you know, uh, uh, Amsterdam is not linked to whether there's geopolitical activity or whether the Federal Reserve is raising or lowering interest rates. That's valuable. So once yeah. you can create value on both sides, you now have a market, uh, a, a, a platform that can actually function. So that was how... Um, we got started, and Osho was chief data scientist from um, the uh, start of Arbol. And what we realized was, look, we have all this climate data, and um, you know, I, I, I we all firmly believe that true innovation stems from your own needs. Like, mm. if you see something that's not working for you, it's likely a problem for a lot of other people. And so, when we think about what was the problem well working with these climate data sets is is crazy it's it's arcane it's uh, you know sitting in these old ftp servers really good data by very well meaning agencies and universities but no standardization no easy access lots and lots of issues and so when you talk to uh, and i've spoken to a lot of climate tech startups one of the first things they spend the first year doing is just wrangling the data cleaning the data processing the data and understanding the data well, we thought, well, we already did a bunch of that for Arbol. Why don't we take what we have done and release it to the outside world? And we had, from our start, been part of the blockchain ethos. We were a white paper, a blockchain white paper. We didn't start out as mm. insurance guys. We started yeah. out as a blockchain white paper to embed these insurance contracts in ERC 721s. Now, here... Along with that, we built a decentralized data infrastructure. And that's what became the climate, uh, uh, you know, an open source public good to allow not just us, but others to build climate tech applications, to build 
applications that help us understand climate risk. Um, and that was sort of the genesis of D-Climate. Amazing. And I'm curious to lean into that spark moment for you, Osho. Like as an engineer and somebody working with large sets of data, sometimes you can see things that other people can't about the way that you can build systems that address these complex problems. Was there a specific moment in your journey at Arbol where you realized, aha, actually, this is something that we could do. You guys have now released Cyclops and Aegis. There's you know, already really strong use cases, but curious to hear yeah, when this moment was for you in your journey. Yeah, so, you know, Seth touched on something really important there, which is that climate data and what uh, what we've collected so far, when I say we, I don't mean declimate, I mean we as people, um, different governments have come together, they've installed weather stations, there's satellites and all this stuff, um, and so we have like a very rich, uh, a number of very rich data sets. But accessing them is not all that straightforward. And because they're maintained for so many different use cases, um, there's there's very little standardization, right? So mm. through our work at Arbol, we see a very particular use case, which is how do we turn this data into time series? And for anyone that doesn't know, time series is really simple. It's just um, your X variable is time. It might be dates. It might be hours within those days. And your Y variable is whatever the measurement is. And once you have that, um, it's kind of like looking at a, a chart of a token price or stock price, right? It was kind of like a long, drawn out aha uh -huh, because um, I used to work on, uh, on Wall Street as well. And... Uh, the majority of my career focused on this idea of alternative data. So uh, basically what we would do, and I did this for a very famous research shop in the space, and then uh, a hedge fund, I did it internally. We would essentially track down data sets, uh, whether that's purchasing credit card transactions, purchasing email receipt panels that show you, you know, what was purchased and the, and the email confirmation you get, all the way to writing scrapers to see how many cars disappeared from a used car website. Um, okay. When you <laughs> How, when, yeah, when you collect all this data and you collate it, you can um, use that to forecast earnings. So I would go into something like Amazon earnings having a very good idea of what numbers they're going to say. And you can imagine that next step of constructing portfolios around it. What's interesting about that experience is when I started doing it, there was very few companies, there was maybe only one or two research shops, there was maybe only one or two very large funds using this kind of data, it was very expensive. And over a period of about four years, you got to a place where almost almost any long, short equity hedge fund now has an internal data science group to work with uh, this kind of data. So how this relates to climate data is very interesting because you have this same kind of, you know, very rich data kind of scattered all over the place, but no unifying infrastructure. Now, the big difference is in the Wall Street world, it's not very collaborative, right? Um, everyone's kind of keeping ideas internally because if they work well, it's good for you and you want to keep right. that as, as close to your chest as possible. Uh, but climate science is quite different. <laughs> science in general is, is decentralized and it's all about sharing ideas. So what if we could create infrastructure that unified this data and made it easy to query? Well, firstly, that would really help with structuring all these insurance products that we're looking at because one day I'm looking at rainfall in Texas and another day I'm looking at wind speed in Amsterdam and then another day I'm looking at, uh, you know, 30-day average temperatures in California. Like, it's, it's all over the place and I can't be hitting, like, 500 FTPs to get this data. So... That's how we that's how we started uh, building this stuff internally, and then the realization I would say the big aha moment was the collaborative piece, which is through through our work at Arbol, our use case is fairly narrow, which is mm. we look at it as data triggers for different insurance contracts, but. Other people have uses for climate data. There's a reason why all this is being collected. So what if we opened it up? What if we made it easy to share data and easy to qual uh, quantify the quality of this data as well? Um, so people know what they're buying when they're going to a private vendor. They know exactly what they're getting when they're getting free data. And if you give people these tools, then ideally they can create climate tech analytics that um, take you from raw data to a nicer UI to something that's much more actionable. And uh, that that's essentially the genesis of, of D-Climate and the, and the data infrastructure it's built. Yeah, it's, it's such a fascinating journey, I think, you know, seeing you guys identify these large problems and 
create a business hypothesis, go out there and test it. And obviously, Arbol is doing very well, and you guys have been successful at, you know, providing parametric ins- insurance, and you're growing. And now, DClimate has, you know, an increasingly large set of data that people can use, and you've now deployed Cyclops, which for me it was a, another edge of a different industry that obviously is related to the others. But I'd be very curious to look at, you know, what motivated you to build out Cyclops. And you know what's the use case? Who's it for? And you know what problem is this solving? Because yeah, I think this is a very interesting example of what can be built on your guys' tech. Yeah, Cyclops is a, I would say it's a probably a long time, uh, multiple threads of uh, uh, interest and passion for me. Um, so I mean, I was my father was in the Indian Forest Service for twenty years. Um, and uh, I grew up around national parks in India, like, and mm. so you know, protection of forests was always a big theme in our family, and the environment was uh, has been since childhood. Um, and I've I've lived all over, uh, in, you know, near tea plantations, near uh, crocodile hatcheries, and snake parks, and all these things for. Uh, it's a whole long set of, uh, in, you know, interesting anecdotes, uh, for you got some stories to share, podcasts. Sid, man, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> a different podcast, probably. But we'll do so that was like the, uh, sort of, you know, uh, early, early, early foundation. And then the other aspect that was always fascinating to me was how remote sensing could be a very, very interesting tool for bringing accountability and monitoring to the environment. You know, I, a big problem with the environmental uh, setup that, you know, exists, and this is true in a lot of countries uh, like India, like uh, many countries in Africa uh, and, and countries struggling with deforestation and other issues is if you can't measure and monitor it, you're not even solving the first step of the problem. Uh, and a lot of things happen because there is insufficient or very expensive uh, monitoring of these very, very important natural assets. And, you know, the local data is often, uh, uh, can be, uh, untrustworthy. And in general, uh, it's, it's not as frequent as you would like. A ground survey sure. is a very difficult thing to do in most of these places. Mm. And so <clears throat> when you think about the, uh, you know, what is the theme behind all the products we keep doing? It's to tackle lack of transparency. It's to tackle the problem of, uh, you know, s- s- bringing transparency and te- uh, technology and capital together to solve a problem, right? It, when you can have that marriage of capital and technology in the right way, uh, then you can solve very big problems. And so when you think about, you know, our, what was Arbo, right? It was understanding that a big problem with insurance is the opacity of the claims process. It's the opacity of uh, how someone even gets paid after a climate event. In the same way, carbon is an extremely opaque market. It's heterogeneous. It is difficult to navigate. Um, You can see this in the carbon credits. It's hard to even, I mean, we've been in it for a while and I'm still like, uh, sometimes unclear on what these different credits actually are referring to, sure. what assets they are actually trying to protect, and who is monitoring all this. Mm-hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, we have seen the sort of uh, fraying of the market because these problems were papered over, because people rushed to the next step without solving. So, for example, in a nature-based offset, it may be, yes, you can put the credits on chain. But if you don't solve the key issue is who is monitoring that credit and does that credit actually uh, you know, reference a real asset, if that's not being solved, you can put it on chain, you can put it on uh, this or that platform, doesn't matter. You're still sure. trading something that lacks transparency, that lacks uh, a fundamental, uh, you know, push to having actual impact. And so then, you know, we've seen obviously uh, some major failures in the space because of that, that you have had, uh, you know, news articles about this uh, offset project wasn't uh, the right way or this wasn't, uh, this wasn't adding as much carbon or, or whatever. So what do we need? We need transparency and we need standards. 
how do we measure impact? And there's no one answer to it, but at least there needs to be a common discussion of it. And it needs to be supported by data. It needs to be yep. supported by frequent measurement. Um, and remote sensing is the only tool we have that can do this at scale. And it yep. is getting better and better. There are satellites going up all the time. So uh, many years ago, I was an advisor to uh, one of the first attempts to launch uh, uh, a commercial radar satellite. So while, you know, uh, and so I learned a lot in that process about the satellite space. And, and you know, it's it just like every other technology, it is, it is rapidly changing and evolving and getting better and better. So that's the premise of Cyclops is let's take satellite technology. Let's take the tools of artificial intelligence, which we use a lot at Arbol for pricing climate risk. Like, you know, how much do you want to charge for insurance? for a typhoon in Hong Kong or a drought in Texas. That's an AI problem. Similarly, the understanding of how much of a forest is being cut, how frequently, what are some risk areas in a project that are more likely to get uh, degraded than others? You know, how is climate interacting with, uh, like, say, uh, slash and burn agriculture? All these problems can be more and more understood by having that uh, not just current, but historical context. So we have Cyclops doesn't uh, just measure ongoing, but we have stitched together 20, 30 years of back history. Super interesting. And that will allow you to also create better baselines. So yes. you're doing a carbon offset project. Well, here's the history of your area. Here's the history of the areas nearby. And this is mm. the context that we can start with when we start to have that conversation of impact. When we start to say, okay, well, these plans were doing this for 20 years. Now, the next year, this happened. This divergence happened. That was clearly due to your work or whatever in the area. So that, that's how we get everyone to start talking about the same uh, topic. And it has to be um, accessible and affordable. Like, we, we don't want Cyclops to be a system that becomes uh, ex, you know, completely out of reach for small projects. And so we have taken great care to make sure that uh, projects large and small can access this uh, tool. And finally, when I started talking about the, the combination of technology and, uh, and capital, the big thing to me with Cyclops to, for us is that um, this is how you build truly accountable carbon credits and offsets. And so what we envision, and that's, this is what Deep Climate's working on, is um, you know, nature-based offsets that pay on a forward-looking basis, conditional on promises being kept. Yes. And everybody having that transparent look, not a black box certification system and something that you know, is some uh, grand standard body that nobody knows you know, what is going on in the back. This is going to be very transparent and allow everybody to stay accountable. Okay, are you protecting the forest? Yes, then here's That's some money. payment. Next uh, year, same thing. So mm. by creating forward-looking accountability, now the impact conversation is taken to a very different level than yes. the current system, which to me still is so backward-looking. It's let's retire an offset for past actions. Well, how's that going to protect the environment for later? For it doesn't ongoing? make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't work. I you know, if you look at the capital flows that these you know right. project developers need in order to form these actions, like it's the market right. really isn't constructed for them. And, and so and it's I, not because they were lacking these basic tools. There's still no sure. widespread monitoring tools, so you can't have it forward looking. Instead, right. they rely on legal agreements that seem really bizarre to me uh, to, 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 okay, so next 10 years, I won't cut the forest, which again, what ends up happening is all the carbon credits then get then focused on areas with a uh, long history of uh, legal protections of private property. Right. And that's not a sustainable not the way to save them, right? Exactly. That's not the areas. We're <laughs> we not need here to, to work in the Amazon uh, and the Congo on, Basin. <laughs> yeah, focus on forests in uh, Pennsylvania or Canada or something. They need protection, sure, but it's right. a very, very different level of threat in the Amazon, in the Congo Basin, in the Indonesian rainforest. Um, 100%. 
So that's sort of the, you know, why does, why, why Cyclops, where does that fit in? It fits into the same theme, just in a different environmental asset class. And I think really this is a phenomenal instance of the regenerative finance thesis. You know, we've been yes. looking at this opportunity for a while now and people are getting really excited. You referenced, you know, the tokenization of nature-based solutions or, you know, um, carbon credits on the blockchain from Toucan and others. And there's a lot of enthusiasm about the transparency that that provides. But you're so right that at the end of the day, it's the fundamental base layer of what people are getting paid to do and what confidence we actually have that they're doing that key behavior and that we can audit it and check whether or not it's being done. And so I I really was super excited, Osho, when you first described this as kind of carbon 2.0. And I remember getting kind of shivers down my spine of like, what are you guys talking about? What are you building? And now, you know, you've got it out in the wild. And I'd love to look under the hood hood a little bit, Osho, and just understand what is the technology that makes this possible? What's the data? Where is it coming from? And ultimately, from a tech perspective, where does this lead? I know you guys are using um, artificial intelligence to train models and create what I understand is more of a predictive capacity. But yeah, I would love for you to kind of unpack under the hood what's going on at Cyclops. Yeah, so with Cyclops, there's there's a couple of interesting things going on. Um, and you know, I think you hit the nail on the head that this is... Uh, this is very much core to uh, the tenets of like refi, right? Because we are bringing data and tech, which helps bring price transparency, which helps bring liquidity to a market. And the whole idea behind refi is how do we gear that liquidity towards long-term um, beneficial outcomes for everybody involved, more uh, more long-term thinking instead of uh, instead of short-term thinking. So if you look at traditional markets. Even things like Bitcoin uh, or altcoins, until there was easy ways to track price, easy ways to chart things, um, you know, capital just wasn't entering. And then you had the proliferation of exchanges and, and all that. And so, similarly with carbon, we're at a stage where carbon offsets are certainly traded, and there's there's volume there. But uh, by bringing these uh, by bringing these stamps, essentially saying this is how much carbon is there, and by being able to do that over a period of time, uh, you can start essentially bringing more uh, transparency for effective price discovery. Um, the other interesting part of Cyclops is when you look at the current methodologies, when you look at manual verification, you can't go back in time, right? But with satellite imagery, you can. You can see what a forest looked like in 1990. You can see what it looked like in 2000. And you can see it every single quarter between that. Uh, with manual verification, you get a single discrete uh, discrete time. But if you can build this history of this is what's been happening, you can effectively create a baseline. So that becomes useful for investors, it becomes useful for project developers, it becomes useful to everyone in the chain because they can start seeing what areas are critical for preservation, whether that's through work on the ground or deployment of capital in, uh, in smart ways. Um, now, on the tech side, things get really interesting as well because once you have at least a little bit of data, you can start trading models to make a guess of what's going to happen next, right? And so this idea of highlighting critical areas starts becoming really cool. If you can forecast deforestation, that takes you one step further from just being able to track it. And again, we compare that to the traditional framework of just seeing what's happening on the ground today, and then maybe we come back to it in a few years and see what's happening, right? So I think all of these all of these pieces uh, are important for refi because refi is fundamentally tech based at least a lot of the problems i see it's it's tech based mm. and yeah. by giving data people can build the the analytical tools and i'm going to end up saying that a lot today right <laughs> yeah. so um, so now with regards to something like uh, like what we talked about uh, carbon carbon 2.0 or co2.0 that's a broader program that uh, that we'll announce in the in the future but the idea is when you take this data the, the, the data generated from Cyclops. Uh, it's what Sid mentioned earlier, right? Which is how do you make payments contingent on uh, preservation? Um, and that is really the key to making, in my mind, a better carbon offset. Now, it's not as simple as the tech, and I think that's where the job is particularly interesting because there is 
a whole side of tech development involved in developing this. And then there is a separate analog side to bring the capital, to bring the supply. And so there's a lot of work that is being done on both. But at a high level, I think one of the one of the really kind of serendipitous things going on is as I look at carbon as a commodity and as a tradable commodity and as one that's getting a lot of institutional excitement, I think it is so interesting and so timely that it's the it's running alongside digital assets. Because I think, you know, when you consider commodity, uh, commodities, unlike gold, unlike oil, you can't, you can't take delivery of a barrel of carbon, right? Or like bars of carbon <laughs> on a ship. So yeah, it's the one commodity what, you can never receive at your door. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's not tangible in any way. And so what are digital assets particularly good at? Well, if you look at what's going on in the NFT world, digital assets are phenomenal at digitizing analog goods. You can take a picture of a painting and now it can live on chain and now you have a liquid instrument that you can transfer around. What if we could do something like this for for carbon? And again, that's the tech piece. And in order to do that, you have to bring the supply and you have to bring the, the liquidity. The nice part of this market is the demand is certainly there. So that, that helps solve one of the pieces. But this this is, I, I look at this as like an ecosystem so there are so many moving pieces, but the core to all of this is bringing that data. Because once you have that data, you can start bridging all these other pieces onto it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd be curious to get your take on the positioning of this product in the broader ecosystem, because it reminds me a little bit of both Game Forest and also Solid World. Obviously, Solid World having the forward financing capacity, which you kind of alluded to in the future. But where do you guys really see Cyclops sitting and who do you imagine using this? And what, what are the core kind of business cases that are emerging out of it? Yeah, so there's there's a couple different um, kind of top of mind use cases for us. One would be project developers helping them uh, do their work uh, on the ground, and there it's a very collaborative relationship because they're also collecting on the ground data. Better on the ground data helps the AI models get better assessments of how much carbon is there, right? Um, so that that is a great kind of like um, relationship to forge. Now, on the market side, um, like I mentioned earlier, there's already you know carbon being traded. It's it's a somewhat popular asset class. So there's a number of exchanges that could find this technology helpful because in the current carbon market, it would be great to see a stamp of approval that says if this offset contains this much carbon, right? Uh, this is what you're buying, and this is what the monitoring records show. So it can work in addition to traditional methods as well. Okay, as a and that's how we like to. That's interesting. Yeah, that's how we like to release all of our technology. Like we like to make it a choice, whether it's parametric insurance, whether it's Cyclops' uh, verification. It can always function as a supplemental to the traditional methods. Or you can use it as a standalone solution. It really depends on your appetite for trying new things, right? Um, and we think that we've built a really easy to use tool. And so if we can integrate it into different exchanges and give buyers peace of mind of what they're, what they're buying, then that helps bring more of that price transparency. It'll help bring more liquidity to the market. And most importantly, it'll help bring more accountability to the market. You won't have these, ideally, you won't have these, um, Get scandals, for lack of a better word, that pop up where forests sure. aren't where people said they were, right? And so we can avoid that problem, and that'll give buyers peace of mind. That'll make uh, that'll make everything a lot cleaner. So those are those are two primary kind of use cases in in my mind for this. Uh, now you mentioned Solid World um, and, uh, and and Game Force, is that right? Yeah, um, solid world. I'm, uh, solid world. I'm, I'm familiar with. Uh, we know Stenberg well. Uh, Stenberg from Denver, who's not from Denver. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah. Um, in the case of Solid World, I really like what they're building, and I actually just got an email update from him. They're doing phenomenal uh, volume. They're they're growing rapidly, and it's just a. To me, it's just a clear, uh, it, it's a clear showcase that there is demand for tools uh, for forward financing, and so if we go to this on-chain data layer, if we go to this um, this sort of uh, digital asset conversation that we were having earlier, well, all of this new uh, all of this new tech 
can plug into these new tools that are being created for forward financing, for yes. lending, right? And that's where, for me, this this was something that was exciting a few years ago. It's getting even more exciting now because there's been more progress. But like DeFi, DeFi was a very kind of interesting explosion of, of ideas. And I have a particular like um, kind of story there. My, my neighbor in college, uh, he was, uh, he, he developed one of the world's first stable coins. He basically developed DAI and was a key wow. architect of MakerDAO. And no he got me into, uh, into crypto because he's talking about things like Ethereum. And, you know, I'd only heard of Bitcoin at the time, so I had no idea what he was talking about, but it got me interested to learn more. He's a brilliant, uh, computer scientists. And so following what's been happening in DeFi, the positives are it's able to source a lot of liquidity the, and use them for all sorts of kind of interesting methodologies around borrowing and lending. The negatives to me are, you know, from a distance, I would say, while there's innovation happening, a lot of it looks like recreating financial tools that Wall Street already had and then later got rid of because uh, there's all sorts of risks that come with using certain tools. Mm. Now, if we can blend the ideas of DeFi and the tech of DeFi with natural capital, that I think is a killer combination. And I think that's the that's the killer app, if you will, that blockchain and digital assets have been waiting for. It's something that can't be done with traditional technology. And it's something that can be done extremely well with the frameworks that are already existing. Totally. And I think we're beginning to see the key building blocks from you guys, obviously from Solid World and several others that will enable this, you know, massive capital flow that has made large public commitments towards impact and financing, you know, the rebalancing of ecosystems and nature all over the world. And it just seems like there's a bit of inertia. And I'm curious, Sid, leaning into conversations you've had with the kind of corporate side, the demand side, how have people responded to what you guys have built at Declimate? And are we beginning to see the signal that actually, yes, this proposition of transparency, um, you know, using satellite imagery is something that can be used to fulfill corporate climate commitments. Yeah, I think it's a very, um, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not the easiest road, but it is starting to chip away. I think some of the recent press around some of the standards bodies having difficulties regarding projects that then turned out to be of, uh, you know, unclear value, things like that. I think yeah. that has really pushed the conversation much quicker on better monitoring and the uh, corporates being able to show that, look, this is actually having an impact. And the only way you can do that is by frequently uh, and uh, transparently showing what's happening. So that's one thing. I think that one of the big issues remains that, you know, things like Article 6 are still not fully clear on what exactly you know you're buying and how much credit you actually get, and so we're in this sort of uh, phase where there's a regulatory sort of uh, fog around you know which offsets will matter, how they will matter, how should they be measured, how should they fit into all these different uh, sta uh, standards bodies and things like that, because the market sort of grew up as a cottage industry uh, and that was a much smaller industry, and now you know it's a million dollar market transitioning to a trillion dollar market. So, but on the flip side, I think there's a lot of uh, different entities that we've spoken to who are, uh, you know, want to take that leap, want yeah. to get in uh, uh, and, and, and start offsetting their emissions because they know that that change is coming, that those regulations and other things will come. And their investors are demanding it. Their consumers are demanding it. So uh, there's a there's and, and, and you know like um, a lot of projects. Uh, I think you're, you're going to see volumes pick up because at some point you you don't have enough carbon removal technology, uh, sure. like not even close, right? So you do need all these solutions to come into play. You need the nature based. You need totally the compliance right. markets, and you need the removal. It actually can't do without any of those, and all these will need to be addressed. Um, the other last thing I'll say is like, you know, something like Cyclops, the other thing it really helps uh, kind of spur is uh, financial products around uh, protecting your investment in the offset. So, yes, carbon offsets being insured is a big problem too. Um, that is another <clears throat> step that helps larger buyers come in because 
okay, you bought an offset and now the forest burns down. What do we do? Uh, you know, that's a big loss. So having insurance as an added financial product always helps to spur more capital into a space. And the beauty with, and that's partly, you know, one of the reasons we tried to build a long back history was that that's how you can underwrite. That's how you can also mm. build a parametric solution. If you have an offset project in West Africa or in Indonesia, and it's difficult to even go and confirm what happened with a ground survey, you could base it on a par- like a parametric solution where if biomass has a catastrophic drop, here's a payout. And we'll just agree to use that data. So it's again another way. It's one more piece of that very, very large puzzle that we're trying to, you know, plug. I absolutely love it. I love tying together the insurance side of it because you're really looking at, you know, the various risks that these corporations are facing. You know, they need something to point to to say, look, this is where the capital went. This is the project. You can see this. Here's the imagery. It's publicly verifiable. And also, you know, we're not relying on these kind of vague buffer pools, but actually there's an insurance product behind this that ensures if something happens outside of our control, that, you know, capital is going back to restoring these ecosystems. And, you know, we're all moving forward with trust and integrity. I'm curious, you know, there's obviously a lot of, you know, potential here from a market perspective, but you guys have made some pretty intentional decisions um, to implement open source and open data. I'd be curious to lean into this idea, Osho, of like what parts of D-Climate, what parts of Cyclops have you guys made a decision to open up and what what is possible as a result of this surface area? With D-Climate, you know, when we're standardizing and, and organizing the raw climate data, you know, our vision was never to become that company that takes publicly available data, cleans it up a little bit, and then charges high subscription fees for it. We want to <laughs> good have done, bro. <laughs> yeah, um, that's that's an easy but uninteresting route. I think it doesn't do anyone uh, anyone good, and we would rather solve more interesting problems. So. What we want to do is leave as much of that data that is publicly available to begin with free. And so to that end, we have done that. What we've done on top of that is give out additional data for free as well. So we use AI methodologies to clean up missing data sets and uh, you know to do all sorts of interpolations, uh, kind of re um, reproject grids, some some heavy sort of climate data processing, which mm-hmm. frankly is not is not cheap and generally yeah. is not offered for free. But we're proud of the fact that we're giving it out for free because it, it just makes it easier to work with. Like, why give someone a broken data set and then pat yourself on the back for saying, you know, I gave it to you for free. Give people the tools that they need mm. to like do the work that they need. The other part is the infrastructure to share data is very important as well, right? So you have all sorts of interesting research organizations, um, all sorts of university affiliated research projects that are collecting highly granular local data. Um, so it's not just, you know, US government wide weather stations. It might be something like University of, I'm just going to say out of name, University of like Washington running uh, weather stations near Seattle, right? So you get much more granular coverage. Giving those organizations the ability to share that data and make it easily accessible to other researchers, that's important. And so, Again, you know, my background's in data science. I I like wrangling data. I like working with these processes. But when we deal with companies and when we deal with teams that are looking to build innovative products, they're not looking to just wrangle data all day. They want to create insights. They want decision makers to be able to look at a report, look at a UI, and quickly understand the problems that they're facing. So that's where that second layer comes in, where development tools will help them build those applications. So one thing the team has been working on, uh, this part hasn't been fully released yet, but it's definitely in the roadmap, is putting together uh, kind of SDKs that allow you to Hmm. easily connect to D-Climate infrastructure and have things like basic UI ready to go. Because when you look at time series data, particularly in climate, there's a few kind of things that we know you're likely going to do with it. You're likely going to have to segment by time. You're likely going to need some sort of uh, mapping functionality. You're likely going to need some sort of charting functionality, right? So these are easy tools that we can give out because we've already built them for ourselves and we don't need to monitor those tools, we want to monetize our bigger analytics software, right? So that's where I think Cyclops is 
really cool because it is kind of a milestone in this vision. Uh, you know, I often talk about the declimate infrastructure as sort of the Apple App Store of climate data, right? And what does that mm. mean? It means that if I give you the data and I give you the tooling to build an application and I give you the marketplace to share that, then you are free to create what you want to create, right? Uh, like it's something what like what Apple did for creating apps for uh, for a smartphone, right? Uh, so that that's where that analogy kind of comes in. Now, in terms of being a milestone in this vision, um, you know. We provided modular data infrastructure uh, for the development of this, you know, what we would consider key climate tech application, uh, Cyclops. And so um, nice. it was natively developed on top of D-Climate data infrastructure, and it'll live as its own uh, as its own separate company. And so I think there's. Uh, I think there's a lot of cool outcomes that can come from this, not just for Cyclops and for D-Climate, but hopefully people in the audience can see the work that we've done here and bring their own ideas and, you know, little coding skills and uh, put together some neat applications. Yeah, man. And this is just one of many, you know, things that could be built with this data infrastructure. And I was really encouraged and kind of curious to, to learn more around this story, um, analyzing the catastrophic flooding events, uh, specifically in New York City, both obviously present past and then also looking at these, um, you know, potential future losses. Can you unpack, you know, what this is, Aegis, how it works, and maybe talk a little bit about the story for New York City? Yeah, so Aegis is a piece of software that we also built uh, that lives within D-Climate, and that's what would be called a physical climate risk assessment tool. Um, that's really just a lot of words to say it, it you know, showcases financial losses for different climate perils across different climate change scenarios. So if you are a business um, and you have physical assets, and I'm going to get back to this point in a second because that, that alone is an interesting statement. Um, if you're a business with physical assets or you are a local government or, or even a local community, um, you can see what your expected financial loss from increased rainfall, from heat waves, from cyclones, from hail, all sorts of climate perils, and we're constantly adding more. Uh, what's likely to happen if temperatures rise one degree Celsius, if temperatures rise two mm. degrees Celsius? You know, There's all sorts of bounds. And so this is... This is something that's necessary for uh, for reporting and regulatory requirements, but I think a much more interesting use case for it is planning, right? If you yeah. know, or if you have some strong idea of what kind of losses you're facing from climate events, then you can be much more proactive about addressing this. And so earlier I said businesses with physical assets. Essentially, this can be anything from you have buildings because maybe you're a real estate company all the way to you're a bank and you have a mortgage portfolio because you've been writing mortgage loans for different customers, right? Sure. So at some level, almost every company has some piece of their supply chain that's exposed to a physical asset, right? Even a tech company like uh, like Amazon or Google, they have data centers. Those are exposed to physical climate risk. So it's uh, it's a very like interesting space because it basically, I, I struggle to think of a company that would not be impacted in some physical way, right? Um, and that's that's also interesting because that's partially the idea behind our goal, which is that these climate events are not just, you know, flooding and things like that. They're, they're much more, uh, much more near-term events that are impacting all sorts of businesses. So, what we did with Aegis was we used the declimate framework, and that's how we're developing a lot of the tools that we hope to give out in the future, right? And to give you to give you an idea of scale, a team of three developers was able to put together the MVP for Aegis in six days. So, <laughs> yeah, um, obviously we have so spent sick. months and months refining models, refining the UI, but if you can get an MVP ready in about a week, and then get that into the hands of a few different institutions to get their feedback, that iterative development process becomes so much faster and you can start wow. building really targeted software that helps, uh, that helps solve the problems that are out there. And so that's where, that's where we had our aha moment with 
the value of the infrastructure we have, right? We want to make that a possibility That's for insane. for other developers. Uh, now, with regards to New York City in particular, you know, I'm dialing in from New York today. I've lived here for the past uh, past 12 years. It's a wonderful city, but um, it's been it's been kind of crazy to see over the past few summers. There have been um, there have been a few different kind of rainfall events that have uh, caused a lot of disruption. Um, there's a running joke uh, for for those who are not in New York in the audience that uh, when it rains, you're you're basically just walking through sludge, going to the subway. Uh, your Uber's going to be like $100 to go two blocks. Like New York City does not <laughs> like when it rains. And so to get a, to get a one in a hundred year rain event is, is that, but like exponentially worse. And having lived here for, for so long, um, it's, it's interesting because the first kind of big storm I remember was Hurricane Sandy. And now it feels like, I haven't looked through the data in particular, but it feels like every summer there's either some remnants of a tropical storm or some sort of large rainfall event that's happening, right? And you look around and the city wasn't built to handle that kind of climate disruption. And it's something that it can do, right? It Mm -hmm. needs to put, it needs to put this as a priority in its infrastructure plans. Yeah, and I think the fact that you guys are making this data open and accessible and showing other people how to build on top of this makes it a lot easier for activists and people who care on the ground to make a clear case for policy to be changed and for capital to be allocated in these directions. And so in that vein, I'd be curious to just kind of brainstorm with you guys, like what else is possible? It feels as though you're beginning to demonstrate some really strong and clear use cases on top of this you know, large and increasing data set. You're plugging in AI models to refine, you know, the ability to really understand what's going on here. And then you've got obviously the ability to tie together parametric risk analysis and, you know, build contracts that pay people for certain events happening. What what do you guys see over the next three to five years? What are some interesting, you know, examples, projects, use cases, things that are coming out of this that, you know, people can be getting excited about coming out of this platform? Um, So... When you think about like you know where what we try to do is build um, technology, then I think we should also mention this that fits in with the current system, but that also enhances it. So not yeah. replacing, but enhancing. And mm-hmm. so we work. We want to work with uh, the different players in the system and help them enhance what they're doing. So I think some of this will be like going back to, for example, the carbon markets. You know, the utilizing more and more granular, frequent data. To help the um, you know project developers, exchanges, standards bodies who are already existing members of the community, um, you know, build better products and be better at what they do. So almost like helping enhance that. Um, as we look forward, you know, there's there's still massive gaps in um, you know where data is available, and then on again bringing transparency to those parts of the uh, environmental uh, ecosystem, if you will. So, for example, we still have very, very poor understanding of emissions data at a granular level. Yeah. We have some you know, remote sense data sets. They are extremely uh, low uh, resolution. And so if you want to keep the emitters accountable, uh, and that, you know, that needs... Uh, more and more satellites to go up on that front. And, you know, one thing you can bet is the climate will be adding those as it happens. So we're looking forward to that on that side. Uh, similarly, you know, when we think about renewables, there's a tremendous amount of hyperlocal data that could help um, bring even more targeted solutions. You know, a lot of these industries are not just about insurance. They need better lending, Right. Climate affected industry should have lending that actually responds to the ups and downs in the climate. I always thought, you know, if I, if I get a farm loan, it should actually have different interest rates based on how much drought there is. Not sure. saying that that's something we'll be doing, but I can see products like this in an age of climate disruption, in an age where uh, we are facing a lot more climate risk, making our systems uh, financial systems and physical systems more adaptable and having more shock absorbers for the vulnerable businesses and populations is going to be the key. And that the only way you're going to do that is by having 
extremely granular, frequent, uh, you know, uh, available data and accessible to everybody. Yeah, and I think the emissions data as a, an example is really interesting because you're really trying to source as much data as you possibly can to get a complete picture on this very complex interconnected web of crises that we call climate. And so um, I'd be fascinated to unpack a little bit around your guys' business model and what are the incentives for people to provide data sets onto declimate and how do you guys actually make money on this platform? You know, I, I'll, I'll start and then I'll show can uh, add his thoughts. What we are trying to do is help D-Climate become a layer one climate tech infrastructure platform. So, you know, we want developers to come build on it and we would, uh, you know, want to share in those revenues and we want to incentivize them with uh, the right tools, the right rewards to make climate tech applications that are utilized by more and more users. And so, you know, there's the, there's that aspect of somewhat being like an app store, but being, um, you know, much less uh, expensive on fees and stuff than, than the Apple store might be. But, yeah. you know, the, the app store concept uh, of uh, allowing other developers to host their applications, to utilize our infrastructure and payment for that. Yeah. Um, on the Cyclops side, you know, it's, it's, it ranges widely. We wanted to keep like, for example, a free tier and a wide array of options so that small projects can access it for very, very Amazing. little cost. And then as the projects go larger, there will be an annual cost for monitoring. And if you want to, as we get Cyclops into, for example, the standards discussions and things like that, if it is used to generate credits, then it would be a different fee structure than just pure monitoring. So that's mm-hmm. sort of like how we want to uh, monetize value add and not raw data or even basic process data. And we want to have that be free and open and allow everyone else to build on it and then, uh, you know, have revenue sources from that. Oh, sure. Yeah, so, you know, Basically, basically what sits out, plus uh, going back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, not charging for publicly available data that, that we cleaned up, where we do see um, opportunities for monetization are building our own applications. We have particular insights into different use cases of climate data, namely insurance, different types of financial transactions. There we would, uh, you know, Products like Aegis, that SaaS software, um, so you can uh, you can monetize a subscription fee there. Um, now on the data itself, an interesting kind of uh, way we monetize that is the data is free for anyone to use. However, when an insurance company or um, you know some other company needs to use it in a financial transaction, declimate comes in as what would be um, as what would be essentially a settlement layer for these uh, okay. for these contracts, and so you can you can be doing that. Yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of like a really easy way to enter markets, and then lastly. We also build kind of specialty data sets as well, right? So I'll, I'll give you uh, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, a researcher or or a citizen scientist, um, they could use wind speed data to plot out you know different areas to build wind farms. And we actually had a group of very talented uh, high school uh, uh, students that wanted to work with our data to build exactly this tool, and they they were able to do that, which is uh, which is great to see that it's easy to work with, right? Um, However, for a wind farm that's, you know, very dependent on certain wind speeds to meet certain generation targets and and make revenue, we can create a specialized index that maps from the wind speed to the turbine level generation. Your your average kind of software developer doesn't doesn't need that, right? But we can charge for that data set because it's a very specific commercial use case. So we're always looking for ways to create interesting indices that get to the core of the problems of a lot of the businesses we work with, uh, what what they face. So that's another area where we would monetize. But what I'm what I'm particularly excited about outside of the work that we're doing is I want to see others uh, come with their ideas, right? Because from yes. our from our backgrounds and our work, we have 
a certain set of experiences and we have a certain vantage point that shows problems to us, but we by no means have an idea of every climate problem that's being faced out there, right? So other people should bring their perspectives in and hopefully use this data and use this infrastructure to build tools that are helpful for the industries and communities that they work with. Yeah, and I think this is where things get really interesting for D-Climate. If you're really able to spark that entrepreneurial innovation of people coming in with a clear insight to a particular market or use case and build on top of your data and you know make this stuff tailored to a specific problem set that otherwise you guys wouldn't have experience for. Uh, I'd be curious to touch around what your guys' roadmap is. Um, I know your Twitter handle is D-Climate DAO and um, you know, everybody has that delicate balance of like what level of decentralization and at what point and at what time. What's your guys' sort of roadmap for decentralization and um, yeah, what are the different kind of components of governance on D-Climate and where do you see this really growing and evolving over the next few years? Yeah, so governance on D-Climate, we wanted to keep it very straightforward. Um, I fall into the camp that a DAO is not... Um, is not supposed to be inundating governance token holders with votes on every single thing, right? The purpose of a totally. DAO is to be automated. Um, and I think some of that in the past few years has really gotten lost within the broader uh, kind of crypto boom, which is yeah. the, the key to DAO is the, uh, is the A, it's the automation. So we try to build automated processes and where governance would be involved is in helping guide those automated processes. So, you know, one interesting use case of governance would be, again, touching on this idea of people bringing different perspectives. Um, Using, using governance votes to set bounties on data collection, to set bounties on the types of um, forecasts or um, analytics tools that are needed, right? So maybe, maybe there's a pressing project for data in sub-Saharan Africa, and there's not a lot of great weather station coverage there. Setting a bounty on collecting that data and setting up the infrastructure to have meaningful collection going forward, I think that's a great uh, way for governance to kind of align and lead to a uh, socially beneficial and financially beneficial outcome, right? Maybe we need an application that specifically is able to look at solar panel generation versus an ideal and um, use that to highlight solar panels that, that aren't functioning to 100% to, uh, capacity, right? Um, that would be a really cool use case that could be used by solar companies, that could be used by people who are using solar panels. I'm just kind of making this up as I go along. Yeah, no, totally. Um, but that's that's something that a governance vote could set into motion because we could set a bounty saying, this problem is worth this many dollars. And so um, someone someone please solve it, right? Uh, nice. So that's, that's where I, I see like governance's that. role. I do not see governance's role as, you know, really getting involved in the day-to-day -day operation side of, uh, sure. of D-Climate, yeah. Yeah, it totally makes sense and it becomes a signal then to the ecosystem in terms of what data is valuable and what applications are valuable and allows you guys to kind of spread your capacity into a larger network of people who are fundamentally empowered by the infrastructure that you've built. Um, yeah. Recognizing we're coming to the end of our time here today, I want to be conscious of what else you guys have going on today. But was there anything that I didn't ask you that you'd want to jump in on before we wrap things up? Um, Thank you. It was quite yeah, comprehensive. I love this. Cover good territory. Nice, yeah. man. And, and for people who are listening and excited about what you guys are doing, what's one thing that they can do to get involved? Join our Discord, uh, follow our socials, and register for the API. Like I said, it's free and start building something cool and uh, ask questions on the Discord. We have a ton of data engineers, we have meteorologists, there's people available to help you bring that vision to life. And if there's a really strong business case, we can uh, we can probably help you get your product to market too. I can't promise anything, but uh, you know, it's always interesting <laughs> to see the uh, the ideas that come up. Super cool. So yeah, for those listening- passion for climate, there's a lot here. Yeah, there's so much there. Um, go, was there anything else that you wanted to add in terms of a call to action to folks listening, Sid? Oh, that, that, was, that was great. 
Awesome, man. So, yeah, you guys on Twitter, if anybody wants to follow, it's at DeclimateDAO. Um, we've got at Crypto Bro Show NYC and at Sid Ja, S I D J H A C E O. Um, and yeah, man, super grateful for you guys coming on the show. Can't wait to see where this all unfolds in the years to come. And yeah, I think this is a, a real shining use case and testament of the power of these tools to solve real world problems with markets at scale. And you're positioning specifically to be enhancement to the existing market and the existing systems I think is totally the right play because it's very easy to become adversarial and to try and build things that are very much apart from the existing market because it's so broken and everything's so wrong but actually then you lose the relationship and the ability to you know help shift the systems into a different state um, so yeah really grateful and actually I think one last thing would be if you were talking to a young founder an entrepreneur um, looking at this market and opportunity excited to build something what advice would you give them. You guys are both super experienced. You've gone through lots of different hurdles in different industries. Um, just be curious to get your kind of founder wisdom. We'll start with you, Sid, and then we'll close with you, Osho. Uh, I, you know, it's. Um, I would say that probably the biggest lesson is uh, the almost infinite level of persistence needed. You know, almost any space you work on will have uh, you know repeated challenges, uh, walls that are built up due to long time, um, you know, things. And it requires a constant effort to find new solutions. And, you know, nine things out of 10 you'll try won't work. And everyone always says it, we all know it, but to live it is a very, very different thing. Uh, especially, you know, as you kind of start out, it things are always very unclear what will work, what may not work. Uh, and you have to really keep an open mind and just keep being creative about trying new solutions. Nice, man. That's a strong take. Yeah, the grit of an entrepreneur, man. <laughs> it's not an easy track. What about you, Osho? Anything in particular to you know, younger founder self? Yeah, yeah. You're going to hear no a million times and you're just, you're just going to have to push through it. <laughs> I think that's, uh, that, that is the reality. Um, but... You know, it's it's important to maintain that sense of creativity. Uh, whatever drew you to the problems to begin with, as you work through them, as you get through the details, it's important to it's important to rely on the same creative processes that got you to step one to get you to step ten, step eleven. You know, um, so keep uh, keep learning, keep having that thirst for uh, for knowledge, and um, just just build. You have to just keep building and shipping as much as possible. Man, I love that for the hopefully the bottom of a bear. I think that's a great story to tell the rest of the space. And man, congratulations, you guys, on everything that you've built to this date. Um, really impressed with the work that you've done. Super bullish on the outcomes that you guys have achieved. And yeah, can't wait to have you on the show in months to come and see where you've gotten to down the road. But for now, I think it's good today and wish you guys well on the rest of your day in New York and hopefully no more big rain. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank yeah, you. Really appreciate sure. you having sure. us on, and uh, and it's been great to see uh, see your work evolve over the past few years as well. And I hope uh, next time we can do this in person in Lisbon. Yeah, man, come, bienvindo, come, come to the studio. Awesome, guys. You have a good rest of your day. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. I would be so incredibly grateful if you could leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast. This helps us reach more listeners, attract amazing guests, and ultimately get the story of regeneration out to a wider audience. It takes just a couple seconds. It makes a massive difference. Thanks so much. And do let us know if there's any guests that you'd love to hear from. We'd be very grateful to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks.